So it's uh, very nice to be back here at the Nordic KPIs. And uh, here's the title of my talk this year. Uh, last year, I was talking about uh, GraphQL. I kind of introduced it uh, uh, from from our point of view. And uh, that uh, that had uh, it uh, provoked some people in the audience. So this year, I want to go back to the roots, to, to SQL. But first, let me introduce myself a bit. So I'm Joachim. I'm uh, currently the chief architect at uh, RAP. RAP is a Swedish startup doing uh, personalized uh, rewards based on your customer behavior. Um, so you can check that out if you're interested. And you can check out my Twitter if you want to hear me rant about things, or my GitHub if you want to see my code. Um, all right, so why would I want to be talking about SQL? in 2017 at an API conference. So this uh, might surprise you. You might be asking yourself this question. Uh, I don't know if anybody uh, has seen this reference before. I uh, encourage you to visit this URL, but perhaps not at work, because it uh, contains some harsh language. Uh, the, but the, the point here is uh, SQL is a very old technology, so uh, you might be wondering what, what it's, it's uh, doing here. And the reason I want to talk about this is uh, that SQL is uh, it's, it's a fourth generation language. Uh, it uh, gives the user of this API, uh, if you consider SQL an API, uh, full control over what, what data they are getting. And if you look at what's been happening in the API space the last uh, couple of years, uh, both with the GraphQL, but also with other things like uh, a JSON API, where you get more control over how many fields you're fetching and, and similar things, uh, we have been giving more controls to, to apps, and more control to the consumers of our API. They, uh, they don't no longer have to rely on the exact things we have defined up front, but instead they, they can decide what's going on. And this is the same characteristics as you have in SQL. Uh, so therefore, I think it's interesting to learn, to learn from what's been happening there. Uh, in a way, this is also like a, a way to to celebrate the hard work that has been uh, done for a long time by by DBAs in uh, in software companies because they. Uh, uh, they are many times the ones that can like uh, rescue the performance of uh, of a system or an API because they they know how everything works together and they know how to fix it. So that's why they put things like this on on their t-shirts. All right. So let's let's think about what what makes something fast. Uh, our, our aim is to make uh, fast uh, APIs. Uh, I think the 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 core thing to think about when you design for performance is to think about the persons who will be exposed to the results of your API. That might be an app user, or it might be a developer. But, but uh, uh, always consider the human, and consider that humans are very impatient. They, uh, they want things to happen immediately, uh, and they don't want to wait. They have a limited amount of time. Uh, another thing to consider is that because we're talking about humans, uh, what is important is not actually a raw throughput. You might think that performance is about how many gigabytes you can push per second. And a gigabyte is an insane amount of data. But what matters to human is how long does it take before, from when I click a button until I can see what I was expecting on screen. And when you do that, what it matters is latency. OK, so let's think a bit about latency. How do we actually make things fast? So here are some uh, some numbers that I think are are uh, good to consider uh, when you think about latency. Uh, I don't know if you have uh, seen this before, but let's let's take a look at uh, a picture that might help clarify this. How many have seen this picture before? I would like to see uh, see more hands because this this picture is I would say this is everything you need to know to design fast software systems. Uh, what this shows is the order of magnitude difference between uh, accessing data from different places. Uh, so you have like CPU caches and main memory all the way to the right, and we have uh, hard disks, and all the way to the left we have we have network access. The problem for us as API designers is we are at this place in this uh, picture. So this means whatever we're doing, we are like 
doing the worst possible thing you could do from a performance perspective. So uh, you, you, you need to think about this when you design your, your API. You, you can't think that it's, it's going to be all right. Uh, you, your, your API design really matters. And I think putting it into human timescales like this really can help you. So, so to be more concrete, you, I mean, you don't want to make your users travel half, halfway to the moon for getting your data. OK. So let's take a look at SQL. Uh, there has been lots of things going on in SQL. Like the first uh, versions of SQL was published in the 70s. Uh, it's a bit vague exactly when it started. That's why I said 40 years of SQL. But uh, I mean, uh, we have learned uh, we have learned a few different things. So I'm going to take a look at the beginning and the middle and the end here. Okay. So the first topic I want to discuss is is uh, uh, data warehousing. So uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with data warehouses, but but what we have learned when building data warehouses is that you have to design your data after the things you are going to do with it. So we have we work with things like start schemas, and this means denormalization. Denormalization means putting data in lots of different places so that they are fast to access from wherever you are trying to get them. So that's something to remember. Uh, another. Uh, a trend in SQL that I would like to like us to think a bit about is the new SQL movement. So uh, you might think this means that we are this is people who are unhappy with with SQL, but I would say this is uh, uh, this is rather people who are trying to improve the status quo. And let's see what we're trying what they have been trying to teach us. So one thing, all of these services we have, I looked, I showed before, they they uh, uh, they try to help you to model your data after your access patterns. So if you have key value access pattern, you have a key value uh, store. If you have a, a, a graph data, then you need something that can be good at handling graph data. So that's one thing. Another thing is that it really helps to keep things simple. Uh, SQL can be it can be hard to understand what's going on in the back end, but if you have something that can only do key value access, there is not a lot of room for mistakes. Uh, and another thing that all of these uh, technologies uh, helps us do is to uh, uh, to get consistent access speed. This is something that's uh, more important than than the the slowest or fastest speed you can get. Like. Uh, when you when you measure things, you want to make sure that you don't have uh, big outliers. You want things to be working the same way every time, because then you can predict what's going to happen. Uh, okay. Now I would like to look at a more concrete example. We saw this in the previous talk, actually. Uh, so this is going to be more or less the same thing. But uh, uh, if you have a SQL statement like this, this is something that make your, might make your DBA be a, a, uh, upset. But actually, what's going to make him even more upset, or her, is uh, if you have something like this, which you might see from an API uh, that is uh, poorly designed for performance. So here we have something that tries to fetch a huge list of things. And then for every each one of these things, it tries to fetch all the related things. If you design your API, you can, you're pretty much guaranteed to have bad performance. And this is what's called the, the n plus 1 problem. Uh, before, I would, would not like to have called this the n plus 1 problem, but the ORM problem, because this, this kind of thing happens when you have uh, an ORM on top of an SQL database, because that does not give you access to this uh, nicer abstraction that the joins give you that can tell the system to give you back exactly what you wanted. Uh, but of course, these days, uh, ORMs are maybe not the relevant thing, but it's, uh, it's a more general bad abstraction problem. You can get the exact same problem in an API if you design it so that you have to do uh, lookups in several steps. Uh, so that's uh, when you do things like, uh, here is the link to the next thing you need to fetch. And th when you fetch that resource, you can get uh, the link to the next one. So uh, in, in many ways, uh, like uh, Puritan REST style or like a, a hate to us uh, approach is the worst possible thing from a performance point of view because of this. It's a, it's a bad abstraction for performance. It forces you into this uh, red territory on the previous slide. And you don't want to be there. Uh, all right. Uh, another thing 
I think will happen as we move towards a more SQL-like uh, API in our backends is that uh, uh, query planning is not something that can be an afterthought. It's not something that that you can say, uh, use consumer API, and it's like our DBAs will figure it out. Because uh, since the the client developers or the consumers of your API, they will really be able to create a difficult situation for you uh, with regards to performance. They also need to be able to understand why they are doing that. So they need something like uh, this. Uh, this doesn't exist yet, uh, but uh, uh, I, I don't know. If you, if you, if you know uh, SQL, you know what this, this means. How, how many knows what this is supposed to mean? Uh, so not, not uh, like half of you, but like in SQL, you can put S explain in front of Every every query that you might write, and then it's uh, the SQL server is gonna gonna tell you how it plans to uh, to execute this. Like, what different tables is it gonna consult? How is it gonna scan them? How it's uh, how is it going to uh, uh, approach uh, aggregation and so on? Uh, this is uh, uh, something that would be great if if uh, future uh, client developers use consuming something like a uh, GraphQL API would have access to. They don't at the moment. So uh, yeah, I, I, I want I want someone to build this. We we have we have good tools in this direction. Uh, you need to do things like request tracing or perhaps even uh, integration into the data loaders, as we saw in the previous uh, previous talk. Like you would want to know what ex actually is going on in the in the backend there. Uh, I don't know how how exactly this will work, but uh, uh, this is something we're going to need, I think. Uh, all right, so let's uh, try to make a summary of, of this. How do we make things fast when we build APIs? So, so the first step is what I think everybody's moving into, the direction of, of GraphQL. Allow clients to, to have full control over what they fetch so that they can get the right things, ask the right questions so that the backend can perform the right queries. Uh, also, help client developers understand what's slow. So that is uh, what I, I, I just said. Like, ideally, you would want to explain, but like, providing logs or uh, uh, maybe just even having a backend developer to talk to to understand the consequences of what what you're doing is is the first step. Uh, you you need to learn what access patterns you have in your system. Uh, you need to consult your logs. We have seen lots of great great tools that allows you to do this. Uh, and uh, yeah, read them, read those logs, and uh, understand what they mean. You, you also need to know what data you have because this can uh, have a great impact on how quick it is to fetch something. So, for example, if you look at the previous example where you fetched a list of things, and then for each one of them you fetched related data. If that list turned out to be huge, it uh, it would make it a lot worse than if this list was small. So maybe it would work great if the list is small, but when it grows, it becomes different. And this is something that's uh, familiar for someone who has worked with the SQL, because you know that depending on the, on the uh, data statistics in your table, the query plan might change. And this is exactly what should be happening in, uh, in our APIs, uh, but uh, they usually don't. So, uh, so when you design this, learn what is going on in your data and design for it. Also, you need to think, I think this is the key message, but you need to design for low latency. You, you don't want to design your API to require several steps to get to the data you want. Uh, and I mean, best is if you think about the end user, but uh, you can also think of it in terms of like an API user. Uh, you, you should design your API so that you can cache things. Uh, the reason this is important is because this takes your red stuff and puts it into the black or blue territory on the, on the colored slide. Uh, so, uh, and that has like orders of magnitudes of difference. And it also means that uh, you want to put your cache as close to the clients as possible because that, also, this, uh, that is another order of magnitude of performance you can gain. Uh, you also want to design your API so that it's possible to prefetch, to guess what the user is going to do next and anticipate that and fetch it even before that has happened. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, uh, th this, this also puts even more uh, uh, pressure on the apps to understand what the user might be doing next, but I, this is a necessity for for great performance. And an example of how this uh, can look, uh, I mean, prefetching wouldn't have to be uh, uh, necessarily fetching. A good example is if you have a photo application like uh, Instagram, 
uh, uploading a photo takes some uh, some time. So what you can do is uh, uh, you can start the upload of, of what you're doing before the user said they actually want to send it. Uh, so therefore, you won't have to wait for the confirmation instead of all of the things that need to happen uh, for it to be actually uploaded. So, so, so designing things in what that way can help performance. And I mean, if you were to look at the raw performance numbers of, of the endpoints involved, they would be the same. But for the user, the experience is things happen immediately. So, so design your API to allow this kind of thing. And design your, your application also to do this kind of thing. Uh, and I think this is, uh, uh, well, the the what makes SQL fit into this picture, because the, the, the thing is not uh, necessarily this particular tools or the particular API technologies you're using. It is how you use them. It is perfectly possible to design a database that speaks GraphQL or SQL or REST that performs very, very poorly. But it's also possible to make each one of these perform well if you keep these design principles in mind and if you keep uh, uh, the order of magnitude difference of uh, latency in mind. So uh, yeah, uh, no, no, no tools and know how to use them well. All right, and I want to leave you with this slide because this is all you need to know about performance. Thanks. <laughs>